All right. Well, we are going to get started. So um, welcome to our session, What's New in Visual Studio Code, um, where we'll cover what we've been working on for the past year to make uh, Visual Studio Code the best plus plus editor for you. Uh, thank you for choosing the time to uh, spend the time with us today. Uh, we have a session packed with demos and as few slides as possible in between. Um, I am uh, Mariel Loparu, and I'm the group program manager for this plus plus team at Microsoft. Uh, and I'm joined here today by. Hi, I'm Sinem Akinja, and I am a C plus plus product manager on the Microsoft C plus plus team. All right. So before we get started, um, one quick thing. Um, after this talk, we're not going anywhere. Um, so just in case we run a bit late and don't get to all the questions, we'll be around and we can continue our conversations on Discord, um, either in the channel specifically created for this talk um, or in the more general Visual Studio channel that covers all our product, including Visual Studio Code. Now, please, please, please take our survey. Uh, it only takes five minutes and it helps us better understand who we're talking with. Um, whether you're using our products or not, um, it's super helpful for us uh, to hear from you. Um, that's why we're here, to talk with as many C++ developers um, as we can. And to put that in context, uh, the reason we're interested in learning from all C++ developers, whether they are customers or not, is because our mission is to empower you, all of you, um, and your teams to achieve more. Uh, we've been on this mission for close to a decade now. so. Um, what does that mean? Um, our team is interested in solving problems um, across our broad industry, not just for our customers. And we don't want the solutions we come up with uh, to run the risk of being incomplete. And that's super important considering um, the areas of focus uh, because we, we achieve this mission by participating in standardization. Um, and it's not just by contributing to the design, but also um, validating uh, TSs and prototype implementations. We do that by investing in the flagship Windows C++ compiler, uh, by innovating in Visual Studio IDE, um, by simplifying acquisition in C++ uh, via VC package and enhancing the C++ experience in VS Code. And obviously in this session, we will cover uh, four and five. Um, and if you're interested though in learning more about the MSBC toolset and the Visual Studio IDE, um, I invite you all uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, where uh, Sai and I will, uh, will discuss all our work in C++20, C++23, performance tuning of the Visual Studio ID and the compiler, um, CMake, VC package, um, and, and more. Uh, Sai has prepared some very cool demos that I can't wait for you to see. All right, so now let's talk about uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, and uh, the first question, uh, is what is Visual Studio Code? Um, Visual Studio Code is the number one most used uh, code editor according to Stack Overflow survey. Uh, it is a free and light editor um, and it has built-in Git support, configurable C++ debugging IntelliSense capabilities, um, as well as integrations with the most popular C++ build systems. Um, and uh, if you're doing more uh, than uh, just C++ you know, want to cust or want to customize the C++ experience, uh, VS Code is highly extensible and customizable uh, from Python to JavaScript um, to tools uh, to further improve Git, uh, key bindings, uh, themes, team collaboration, and more, you name it. Um, even the C++ support uh, is an extension. You can easily acquire or uh, substitute um, if uh, uh, you know, uh, you're so fancy. Um, VS Code um, is also a uh, cross-platform. Um, uh, and what that means is that it runs on Mac, on Windows, on Linux, um, or uh, even in the browser. And um, wh whether you need to connect remotely uh, to an intranet machine or in the cloud, to a VM, container, WSL, or an embedded device, uh, you, you get the same consistent experience. Now, for C++ specifically, um, you will primarily interact with uh, three VS Code extensions. Uh, CPP tools, uh, which add C++ language support, including uh, IntelliSense and debugging features. Uh, CMake tools, which enables a full featured workflow for CMake projects. And uh, Makefile tools, which provides IntelliSense configs and build and debug aids for uh, Makefile projects. A note for those folks using you know, other more uh, royal build systems that are interested in VS Code, uh, both the CMake tools and the Makefile file tools uh, extensions are open source. Uh, and there are two great examples at uh, different levels of sophistication of how to uh, integrate a build system into VS Code. 
Now, um, this was a, a high level intro. And for those of you that already use VS Code are probably wondering, well, um, how about what's new? Uh, well, there's uh, plenty of new stuff uh, all around. And uh, there is uh, probably no better way to show you this than uh, to switch directly into a demo of the product. OK. For this first demo, we will configure, compile, and debug a C++ code base from scratch on a vanilla Mac machine. For context, what do I mean by a vanilla Mac machine? Uh, what I have here uh, is a MacBook with its out-of-the-box apps, nothing else. In addition to that, prior to this demo, I've installed Homebrew in order to acquire CMake, Ninja, Package Config, uh, which are tools we need to, uh, in general, for building a C++ project. In the process, Homebrew requires to install Xcode compilers and libs, which we will also need to compile uh, the C++ code in our project. Other than that, all I did is install uh, Visual Studio Code and install a set of uh, extensions and extension packs that are important for C++ development in VS Code, um, with some that I'll show you today. Um, and that's all there is to get started. Uh, one note um, that the command line shown here to install VS Code extension is a recent feature that makes it super easy to install all of these extensions at once. Um, and it's a good alternative to the extension pane um, if, if you know what you're looking for. All right, um, let's switch back to VS Code and open the code base. Um, the code base we will use today is called OpenTDD, uh, which stands for Open Transport Tycoon, and it's a simulation game for building transport networks. Um, this is a game I'm very fond of, and ever since I heard it's open source a few years ago, uh, I've been trying to find ways to learn more about the code and uh, maybe implement some of it the ideas I have from the time I played it. Um, this time around, I have found a few more folks interested in this and uh, um, we'll try to work together uh, to keep us motivated. Now, there are multiple ways in which you can go about setting up a machine to build a C++ project, of course, and uh, what I'll share with you today will be um, an, uh, an opinionated view of how to do it. Um, if you don't like something that you see, uh, there's probably an alternative, and you should ask me after, after this talk about it. My approach um, is uh, opinionated because um, I want to make it as, um, as simple as possible for everyone else in my team uh, to set up an environment for, for this project. Uh, so I want to um, end up with um, as few prerequisites and setup steps as possible. Uh, to have uh, to be done manually on the command line. Um, case in point, uh, the CMake Tools extension has identified that uh, the workspace has a CMake list.txt um, and is offering to configure the environment using the compilers that uh, we just installed uh, that it has detected uh, part of its uh, CMake kit setup. Now, this is perfectly fine setup if what you want is to configure just this VS instance uh, on, on this computer. Uh, but what I want is to configure CMake for the whole team. And to do that, I'll be using uh, CMake presets in just a bit. So to enable CMake presets, I will go to the same folder where uh, CMake list.txt lives and uh, create a new file called CMake presets.json. Now, what is this file? Uh, this file is part of a, of a relatively new uh, CMake feature that allows uh, managing a multiple CMake configs called presets uh, inside a single JSON file that in turn can be shared with the whole team. So um, rather than sharing um, you know, in, in, a, in a document perhaps, uh, what are the command line switches needed to correctly invoke CMake on the command line uh, to build our project? I can capture all that information in this file. And um, the same is true for, for build presets as well as, as test presets, if I have any. Uh, the moment I save, you'll notice VS Code status bar um, uh, switch its uh, CMake UI from a kids configuration UI to a presets configuration UI. And uh, we'll use that in just a bit. Uh, you can see that the selection buttons for the configuration, build, and test presets in the status bar have appeared. Um, and we'll be using that to switch between active configurations. Um, we don't have any presets yet, so uh, we'll start simple uh, with uh, just a configuration preset. Uh, VS Code allows you to add new presets, um, and you have a few options to pick from. 
Uh, you can learn more about each option in our docs, but for this, uh, I'll just select custom and we'll provide a name. Let's, let's say um, a debug. Uh, and the config presets showed up uh, in the file. Now, I do want to point out that the help we're getting writing this file uh, is coming from two sources. First, VS Code knows about the syntax of this JSON file and can provide um, explanations for each of the fields and even autocomplete for fields um, we want to add. The other source uh, is uh, GitHub Copilot, uh, which provides suggestions that are relevant to our project based on um, its uh, AI analysis of other projects with, um, with similar capabilities and in a, in a, in a similar state. Um, what we do need to add here uh, to this file is a toolchain file to integrate VC package into our project. Um, small parenthesis, OpenTDD, as with most C++ project, has its own C++ library dependencies. And um, rather than uh, depending on system package managers, um, we're going to take advantage of uh, VC package to consume these dependencies in source form and compile them before building our project. Uh, Copilot. Uh, now, hasn't really read my mind about the toolchain file and suggests installed there, um, which, which is, however, a, a better alternative to the CMake install variable specified below. So, um, so let, let's accept Copilot suggestions and, and uh, let's also delete this variable. Um, let's now specify uh, the toolchain file uh, path uh, and point to the VC package toolchain file. Uh, as I make this change in the JSON file, uh, GitHub Copilot again provides me with, with a suggestion which I will accept because it is, it is the correct one. And while you can primarily use Copilot for source code, uh, and I'll show it in action in C++ in just a bit, um, you can definitely use Copilot to get some much needed help when authoring configuration of file in popular formats as well. Um, all right, so now we have a uh, config preset and uh, let's instruct VS Code to activate it. Oh, it's not listed yet. Uh, so there's still a problem with the presets file. And yes, if we, if we can go to the problems pane, it looks like we're missing a required property version. Um, let's add it quickly. And now we should be able to uh, select uh, the preset. There we go. Okay, let's fix the name quickly too. All right, so we're all set to consume C++ libraries from uh, VC package now. Uh, let's find out what libraries we need to consume by taking a quick peek at uh, compiling MD. Uh, so here's the list. Now, I can go in the integrated terminal uh, to the VC package folder and uh, search for each of these libraries to see if they are in the VC package catalog. Um, they're definitely there uh, because VC package has more than 1900 C++ libraries ready to be built. Um, and once I find my libraries, I can easily um, install them on the command line. But again, if I do that on the command line, um, it will only install them on, on my machine. And if I want my team to have the same environment, this will be yet another command they'll need to run. Luckily, there's a better way. Um, using VC package in uh, manifest mode um, will allow me to specify the full set of libraries to get installed automatically by each member of my team when they first configure their, their CMake project. To use VC package in manifest mode, we need to create a simple JSON manifest called VC package.json. Let's, uh, let's bring it side by side with the doc file and let's specify the dependencies first. Um, let's specify the required fields, which are name and um, version. Next, Let's uh, specify the dependencies one by one. First is Zilib, and immediately the second suggested uh, library by Copilot is libpng, which we'll accept as a suggestion. Uh, some other libs are suggested as well, but let's add the ones that this specific project also uses, which is uh, LZMA and LZO. And we're done. Once uh, the file is saved, um, we are ready to configure and build the project for the first time. Let's, uh, let's start the configuration. 
If you look closely at the output during the configure step, um, VC package is automatically run uh, and a VC package installation step is automatically started. Um, this will read the manifest we just created, download and build all dependencies, and correctly set up CMake uh, to be able to consume them via the find package commands. Once uh, configure is done, uh, we're, we'll be ready to build the project and see it run for the first time. As you would expect, uh, VS Code is able to run this command for you, but VS Code uh, through uh, the CMake Tools extension can do a lot more than that. Um, it also configures the whole environment, including IntelliSense, for all the C++ files in your project. So, whether it's uh, compiler switches or uh, macro states or paths to third-party libraries, uh, you can uh, that can affect the correctness of, uh, of IntelliSense. Um, uh, VS Code now knows all about this stuff. Uh, it configures the debugger to light up to its CMake targets in the project as well. So while the build is going, let me give you a quick tour of, of these capabilities. Um, as soon as the CMake configure step completed successfully, uh, the CMake pane was populated with all the CMake targets in our project. Um, if you right-click on the target, you can build a target individually, uh, you can debug it, uh, you can uh, run it in the terminal, um, or um, you can open the CMake script at the exact line where the target is defined. By uh, expanding uh, the target, you can see uh, the list of all the source files contributing to this target. Of specific interest at times may be the generated files that normally uh, you wouldn't be able to see in the source tree, but you would be able to see them here. Um, and when you open these files in the editor, like I said earlier, you can get high fidelity IntelliSense consistent to the way you are compiling the specific files in your project. And you can make use of a lot of code navigation capabilities. Let me open a larger file. Uh, let's say uh, train GUI.cdp. If I go to the outline, I can quickly navigate between the functions defined in this file. More so, for um, any symbols here, I can do find the references to do a holistic search across the whole project. Uh, let's say we want to find all calls to this function. You can see the C++ extension processing the request and the results will be displayed in the references pane. Um, depending how you choose to use this list, uh, you can also uh, use it as a triage area. Um, as you're done investigating some code locations, you can remove them from the list uh, to keep easier tabs of your progress. Okay, so switching gears now back into the editor, let me point out some uh, new functionalities for um, that um, once you bring your code base to Visual Studio, you can take advantage of. Uh, maybe an obvious one, but uh, bracket uh, pair colorization is a real time saver. Okay, to make it really clear what I'm referring to, it's, it's the use of different colors for braces, uh, but making sure that the matching brace has the same color. Um, this is on by default in most recent releases of VS Code. Now, as I scroll, you'll notice something else happening inside my editor. Uh, this is not yet on by default, but you can turn it on in the settings, and it's called Sticky Headers. Um, it automatically pins the relevant lines of a class or function definition at the top of your editor such that um, if you're like knee deep inside a long function um, with uh, one click on the header, you can navigate right at the beginning of that function. Again, these are called sticky headers, um, and when dealing with large code bases, they can be a real time saver as well. Another thing that can help you a ton when uh, ramping up on a new code base um, is its comments. Um, specifically for uh, this code base, I'm so lucky that the maintainers of the OpenTDD code base have so much attention to detail and have um, uh, documented the code very well. Um, they use Doxygen and um, VS Code knows how to automatically pick up the specific, uh, specially formatted comments to, to render rich tooltips for all of these definitions that have Doxygen comments. You can also easily um, copy content 
of these tooltips if you need to. Of course, it is um, super important that as uh, new functions get added and the code evolves, uh, that this uh, Doxygen comments continue to be created. Uh, and that's exactly where uh, VS Code can help. So let's add a new function really quickly to show you what I mean. Um, let's get some quick help from Copilot uh, on this one too. Uh, let's say we need to find the value in a vector of pairs of int and int. Uh, we'll take Copilot's suggestion for the implementation. Uh, and now, if you hover over its definition, the tooltip will just carry the comment above it that we just typed. Um, but if you look down, it's not as rich as the doxygen comment uh, that this uh, function has, but that's easily fixable. Uh, let's delete our comment. And um, as we do that, you'll see a light bulb pop up uh, that uh, allows us to create a new doxygen comment. Uh, we'll take that option even though the same thing would happen if I would just type the slash star star right before the function definition. Um, all right, so this gets injected and now we can provide um, the quick explanation of each of the parameters and the function. So let's type that in really quickly. And now when I hover over the symbol, we get a rich tooltip fully populated with the oxygen comment for our newly added function as well. All right, that's good. Uh, but sometimes uh, quick info tooltips with doxygen comments are not quick enough. Um, but with a new feature we just added, VS Code can help even more with the speed reading your code. Uh, the feature I want to show you now is called Inlay Hints. Um, and the way I have it configured on this machine is to activate when I press Control and Option at the same time on my MacBook. Um, you can really see how this is helpful um, because in this example, the third parameter here is y, um, but that doesn't tell us much about what the function expects. Uh, going back to the tooltip, uh, we can learn that the third parameter is called top, uh, but with uh, inlay hints, I can gather that info in, with no interruption as I just read the code. Really quickly, I want to comment on the density of these hints as well um, that are getting injected in your editor. Um, if you look at uh, this other function call here lower, um, you will note that no hints get added when invoking the lay hints. Um, and the reason for that is, is somewhat simple. Uh, all of the actual parameters are uh, matching the names of the formal parameters in the function declaration. So in terms of readability, the inline hints uh, would simply be redundant, right? There are many customization points for inlay hints as well. And if, if I bring the settings window and search for inlay hints, um, you can see I can customize when inlay hints are shown. So currently it's off unless I press the magic combination. Uh, but there are other modes, including having on by default all the time. Specifically for C++, there are uh, several other customization points I invite you to explore as well. Uh, for example, showing hints for auto, which is another easy trick to improve your speed when reading the code. So if I go back and I do auto a equals 12, uh, the inlay hints will uh, quickly pop up and uh, I can keep going and um, it will keep up with, uh, with my typing. I do hope you enjoy this um, and I'm looking forward to hear your feedback. Um, I think it's always good to have easy access to the rich insights directly into your editor as you write code. Okay, and, and one more thing. Um, no, I don't want to save this file. Um, what I want to show you last in this demo is VS Code's Clang Tidy integration. Uh, and to do that, I had to create my own badly written C++ file uh, because it turns out OpenTD is pretty good at uh, keeping their code wording clean. Um, ClinTidy is another tool that um, you want to have uh, easy access to in order to run often and, uh, and keep your code uh, safer, more modern. Um, so VS Code ships with ClangTidy in the box. And its integration is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and before diving deeper, really quick suggestion. To make uh, the best of ClangTidy, you want to make sure that you don't have compilation errors. So 
As you can see in this file, we have um, one error that DICE is undefined, um, and this can confuse claim tidies analysis on this file. Um, so let's fix it really quickly. And of course, the ever-present GitHub Copilot will help out uh, us once again. And at least the signature of this function is spot on, so we can move on. Um, now you can run code analysis manually from the context menu. Just right click, run code analysis. But what I like doing is having it run every time I save the file. It's easy to change from the settings. Um, I'll just search for code analysis auto. And uh, this will, will give me the true relevant settings. Uh, first one you want to make sure that it's on is the claim tidy integration. The second one is the generic code analysis run automatically setting. This will uh, make it so that every time the file is saved, code analysis runs. Easy. Now we edit the file save in Clint Tidy just ran. All right, there, there's still no warnings. Um, but this will allow me to show you how easy it is to configure Clang Tidy to, to enable new checks. Again, I can do this from the settings in VS Code, uh, but that will only configure my environment. What I wanna do now is to share my configuration with my whole team. Uh, and to do that, I'll create a .clang Tidy file at the root of my workspace that I plan to check in into source control and share with the team. And here, I can specify what checks I want to run, and I can push the envelope here by enabling you know, modernization checks that don't run by default. What I'm going to turn on is all of the modernized checks, portability, and CDP core guidelines checks from client tiny. Now, if I go back to the file and save it again, we should get a lot more warnings. Okay, there we go. You can navigate all of them in the problems pane, but also directly in the editor as squiggles. Um, the tooltip allows you uh, to get more details in line about the warning, including uh, a link to documentation for the warning. And for some of the warnings, you'll have quick fixes available. Yes, quick fixes. And if I fix, in this case, this uh, core guideline warning, um, we'll see the results of that fix immediately in the editor. You see the initialization show up and the construct initialization being removed. Okay, let's keep going. Now, this warning is pretty opinionated and just stylistics, but hey, let's be warning free. The quick fix menu can also be accessed via the light bulb uh, when the cursor is on the warning. You have several options here in this menu to apply the fix. You can press Control Enter to only preview the fix or just enter to apply it like we did before. Uh, if there are more warnings of the same type in the file, you will also have the option of applying all the fixes for that type throughout the file. And you can also apply all the fixes for all the warnings in the current file. Alternatively, you can clear warnings or you can even disable them. It's really quick uh, to apply this client tidy fixes and you can also do so from the problems pane, by the way, as well. All right, so now that uh, our build is done, we are ready to run the game and debug it. Uh, one way to do that, as I mentioned earlier, is from the CMake pane. Um, Right-click on the target and select debug. Uh, sometimes, however, um, you may need uh, to customize how you launch your debuggy process. Uh, you can do that from uh, the debug pane. Uh, to learn more how to do that, uh, you can follow this link um, to our docs uh, that go into a lot more details about the options you have at your disposal. Um, the way you configure it is by adding a new CMake debug configuration. And there are multiple templates here to help you get started quickly with both uh, building and debugging C++ files. Uh, for this demo, since we're already using CMake uh, to build our project, I'll just uh, select the LLDB launch option. Uh, in the debug configuration that got created, first things first, we need to replace the program name with our program. Um, but what's the program name? Of course, you could hard code it. Um, after the CMake configuration, uh, you can find out the, what the binary name is. Um, but there's a better way 
that allows uh, multiple people in your team uh, to use. And that's actually to use a command from the CMake Tools extension uh, to get access to the program name that it's actively selected uh, in, the, in the status bar. And again, uh, Copilot to the rescue here, uh, if you use uh, the CMake launch target path, that evaluates, as I said, to the selected target that launch here in the status bar. And if you were to change it to another target, when you restart the debugger, the new target will be launched. There are more customizations you can do, and one common one is to pass extra arguments to the debuggy um, or add additional environment variables. One common one is to change the path by appending additional directories, and um, there are more command uh, uh, provided by CMake tools uh, that you can take advantage in this case. Um, I will use the launch target directory, for example, to add it to the path variable so that the process can maybe find some of the assets that are saved in the target directory. Okay, so that's how you customize a debug session. When ready, just click the arrow uh, button and debugging will start. And with that, um, I wrap up our first uh, demo today. Uh, we have successfully compiled this project from scratch on a vanilla Mac machine. In the process, we have created configuration files that can be leveraged by the rest of the team. And in our next demo, we will take this code base and the configuration files we created to Windows and Linux to make sure we have uh, an environment for all of these popular OSs uh, that you may want to target together with your team. Thank you. Let's go back to the slides now. All right. Well, um, we covered a bit of the ground on, on these demos. And uh, before we move on to the demo on the Windows machine, uh, let me go really quickly through some of the things you've seen for which uh, I have some slides with links that can provide you with more information. So specifically, you saw CMake preset, presets. And uh, what we did, we just scratched the surface of what CMake presets can do. Um, in addition to what you saw, you can have build presets, test presets. You can even have inheritance between presets so you can maximize uh, the sharing across uh, multiple presets. Uh, but the bottom line is that this allows you to invoke uh, CMake in the same way across Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, uh, command line, and CI systems. And uh, in the process, uh, you know, get a great IntelliSense and debugging experience for your C++ code. So check out the link below for more information. Uh, in our demo, we also uh, simplified C++ library acquisition by using VC package manifests. Um, it's really that simple. There was no magic behind the curtain in the demo you saw. Um, all I did is just clone VC package as a subfolder of my code base and uh, bootstrap following the two-step two, two instructions at the VC package.io website. Um, VC package has uh, more than 1,900 libraries in its catalog, the largest catalog available, and its uh, enterprise capabilities that uh, expand to you know, closed source libs, binary caching, uh, and more recently supporting embedded development uh, will provide you and your team with, with a clear advantage. Now, if you want to learn more about the advantages of using a package manager, uh, please check out the recording for Augustine's session on, uh, on Monday. Um, you also met my copilot today, uh, GitHub Copilot, uh, which is available uh, in many other popular environments and for many, many more languages. Um, with uh, Copilot, uh, you can spend more time you know, learning by doing, um, with the added bonus of, of some confidence, hopefully. Um, Copilot uh, is already generally available. And uh, if you are a student or an OSS contributor, uh, it's free. Um, a version of Copilot for companies, uh, it's coming later this year, and uh, you can sign up your team now. Um, so check out the link below for more information. And last but not least, with every update of Visual Studio Code, uh, the, the C++ experience for editing and code navigation is getting better and better. Uh, clean tidy warnings and fixes. Uh, inlay hands, sticky headers, uh, to name just a few, are features we hope uh, will get you more excited to code and focus on what's truly important, your productivity. Of course, a lot of these improvements were done based on your feedback um, and suggestions. So um, thank you for everybody that shared their feedback and a, a good call to action is keep the suggestions coming. Um, and with that, uh, let's continue our demo on the Windows machine. 
So here we are on a freshly installed Windows 11 machine and uh, my goal is to get the same OpenTDD project that we build on the Mac uh, to build on this machine as well. Uh, really quick, this machine only has a few prerequisites that I installed prior to this. Um, I'm using Visual Studio Community uh, with a C++ workload that comes with um, uh, CMake, uh, Ninja and the MSBC compiler. Uh, alternatively, if you don't have access to Visual Studio or you prefer a more um, Linux-like environment on Windows, uh, you can install MinGW from MSYS um, and uh, then use uh, MSYS Pacman to install GC, CMake um, and Ninja. Um, other than that, I installed Visual Studio Code and uh, the exact same uh, list of extensions that I had on the Mac as well because we're on Windows and we have access to WSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, we'll also use this machine to build OpenTDD for Linux. Um, not only that, but because we're on Windows 11, which uh, supports uh, Linux uh, GUI apps via X11, um, we'll also be able to see the Linux version of the game running. Um, if interested, you can use the link on the slide to get more info how to get your own Windows 11 setup for WSL working as well. As for uh, VS Code and WSL, I didn't have to do anything additional because all of the extensions listed here work equally well with the Windows and WSL environments. Okay, so I cloned the OpenTDD repo here, um, including the configuration files we have created earlier. Um, and uh, now we can open VS Code uh, by just typing code dot in our terminal window. Um, dot being the current folder uh, we're in. Um, VS Code will start loading and it will index the OpenTDD workspace for the first time. While this happens, uh, uh, let's uh, open uh, Ubuntu Bash prompt as well. Here too, I have uh, cloned the OpenTDD open folder uh, and um, I am uh, ready to open it in VS Code. To open it in a VS Code remote session connected to WSL and to open the OpenTDD directory as a workspace, all I have to do is write code dot in the same way I did in PowerShell for the Windows enlistment. That's pretty convenient. Um, VS Code will do all the work for me. Uh, connect to WSL2, activate the CMake presets configurations for as it discovers that this is a CMake repo uh, in the folder I instructed it to load. Um, and this experience is consistent to what we, we saw on Windows and on the Mac on, on the previous demo. Now, to compile OpenTD on Linux, we need uh, two more libraries. Um, and I could just add their names here in uh, vcpackage.json, um, but that will also cause folks uh, from my team that are using Windows and Mac and don't need these two libraries um, to unnecessarily compile and build them as well. Of course, uh, VC Package Manifest allows us to uh, easily specify um, if a package is specific to one platform you're targeting or another. To do that, we'll specify the name of the library and add a platform uh, property to tag that it's, uh, this is only needed for Linux. By the way, this platform property um, supports even more complex conditions than just the US name, and uh, VC Package Docs cover that in detail. Okay, uh, font config is the other library, and now we should be ready to start the build. The two builds, I mean. All right, so um, going to the uh, Windows instance uh, to launch the build. Um, and um, as soon as it starts, you can see that uh, the CMake configure runs uh, for the first time. And just like on the Mac earlier, VC Packet integration kicks in and it picks this time the x64 Windows triplet uh, to build our dependencies. Let's also start a WSL build uh, to now, and uh, uh, now that we added the two missing dependencies. And uh, similarly, uh, using the same configuration file, CMake uh, integrates with VC Package in order to uh, acquire and build from source all of the dependencies we specified in the manifest file. Now, this will take just a bit, um, uh, enough for me to emphasize once again, how um, consistent the development experience in VS Code is across the, the three operating systems we've seen today. And um, the configuration files we created in our first demo are taking care of the bulk of the upfront configuration here. Um, These configuration files are not VS Code specific. 
Um, and um, you can use them with other IDs as well, like Visual Studio, Atom, Emacs, or, or even on the command line, or uh, in uh, CI systems. Um, where Visual Studio Code shines is in how it lights up its environment, you know, uh, IntelliSense, debugging, for your project in the presence of these files. Okay. WSL build is almost done. And starting debugging. Okay, we did it. We have both versions running in parallel. And to be honest, every time I see a Linux window running on Windows, my heart still startles when I see it. So we built this project on all the OSs we were planning to, and now I can confidently share uh, this configuration file with my team, and I can start focusing on game-specific uh, changes that are not OS-specific. More specifically, I have some changes I have uh, stashed that I, I, I want to show you really quickly. And uh, before we switch the branch and apply my changes, uh, I want to quickly point out how the source control pane does not only let me manage the OpenTDD repo, but also any other repo in the current workspace as a separate entry. Uh, VC package in this case is just a subfolder of OpenTDD, not really a git sub modules. I'm not a big fan of that. But uh, just having another git repo in the same workspace will just show up in here. And this is super useful if you're working with um, uh, larger teams, for example, that contribute to varied GitHub repositories that all aggregate in a single code base. You know, rather than having to open multiple instances of VS Code for each repo, uh, you, can, you can work on a change that, for example, spans multiple repos from the same uh, instance of, uh, of VS Code. Okay, so let's switch the branch and apply my stash. And now um, we'll, we'll start a debugging session to see what these changes do in the game and why I'm not ready to push these changes up yet. And we'll start a build and we'll, we'll, we'll kick in the, the debugging session. And um, so to give you some context, th this changes add labels or, or signs to each of the vehicles in the game. Um, this is uh, something that uh, I believe will improve my gameplay because uh, especially when the map gets busy, uh, it will be much easier to spot my trains on the map. I feel I'm very close to completing this, but I still have a, a, a big bug. Um, and um, now if it loads, you'll see, uh, you, you can look at these trains entering um, a, a tunnel over there. Um, their, their sign gets stuck at the entrance of the tunnel. Here's another coming in and you'll notice the, the, the sign getting stuck again. And this sign doesn't get refreshed until the train exits the tunnel. So for example, this train entering will exit here and the moment it comes up, the label will get refreshed. But um, obviously it gets stuck there at the entrance. And this is quite displeasing for, for the aesthetics of the game. And um, not the kind of code that I, I, I want to, to push up. All right, so you've seen the problem I have in code uh, in, uh, when the app was running, and um, now I'm pretty much stuck because I don't really know how to fix it. Um, luckily, uh, a few more folks from the team started looking at the code, and um, I'm going to reach out for help, uh, hopefully uh, get other ideas of how I would be able to approach this. Um, and uh, to do that, um, I will use um, the live share functionality in Visual Studio Code um, and I'll reach out to CNM. We you met earlier as we started the talk. Um, and um, what live share does, it creates a shared collaboration environment where she can jump in and see the changes I have uh, and maybe brainstorm on ways uh, of how to uh, fix this problem. Uh, to get us started, um, I will click share and this will uh, create a, um, a session on uh, a live share and it will automatically copy to the clipboard uh, the link to, um, to the session and here uh, off screen uh, I will send uh, Sinem the link. Hey Sinem, uh, are you getting the link? I just sent it to you over chat. Will you be able to join a session and uh, uh, discuss the problem I'm having with the uh, OpenTDD code base? Yeah, I'll open it right now. Awesome. Uh, 
Okay, so um, I see you joined the session um, and by default um, you are following my cursor on the screen and right now you're in the VC package JSON file where I can see also your uh, location. So since you're following me, this will give me uh, a chance of showing you where I got stuck. Um, and hopefully uh, you can help me out. So let me do uh, control P and go to uh, train CMD file, um, which is the, the file um, that I got the closest, I think, to solving this. And it's in the train controller uh, function. Um, and if you're still following me, I'll just do go to definition. And um, inside this function, there's a lot of uh, state around how the trains are moving on the screen. Uh, and um, here, uh, the, you can see that uh, for each uh, vehicle, there's a track, um, a member variable that tracks the state. Um, and this is the, uh, the bit that I come the closest. The, the wormhole is, is the tunnel uh, in this case. So this would be uh, finding the place where we would need to hide it. But the problem is if I uh, go really quickly to definition here, oops, let me use this one, go to definition. Um, you can see this is part of, uh, of an enum with lots and lots of states. And every time I'm trying to find places in the code where the state changes, there's like lots of places with left, right, left, right. You can see here uh, states changes and I, I can't find the right place where the train enters uh, the tunnel. Um, do you have any other ideas or maybe is this the right approach to take? Yeah, um, I have some ideas. I think maybe first we can take a look at the git changes that you've made to see if maybe something you changed might have caused this issue. I see. Okay, let's switch to your screen uh, and I will switch to following you. Um, right click follow participant. Okay. All right, so first looking at source control, I see you made some changes in the vehicle.cpp files and the header files. Um, Taking a look at your changes, it looks like you just added some include statements and um, added some information to some of the definitions for some variables. So I don't think that these changes would particularly cause this issue. Um, so it doesn't look like any of the Git changes that you've made would do this. Fair, Fair enough. I, I, I want to I wanna pause for a second, though, this investigation and ask you, um, I see on your screen you're in a browser rather than inside of Visual Studio Code. Maybe you can talk a bit about that. And also the fact that you are seeing my changes that are locally on my machine on your screen, it's also interesting. Can you talk a bit about that too? How does yeah, it work? so what I have is a browser instance of your VS Code session instantiated based on the link that you sent me. And this is just through VS Code.dev, which um, I'm able to basically see your session and enact changes on your se session and view any changes that you made. But your computer does basically all the manpower behind any of the computations or debugging that I would do within my um, session. So I just call on your computer to do basically any sort of um, debugging that I would need. So for example, if I'm viewing a definition, um, it'll call on your computer to view the definition. And um, I could also view this within the IDE, but I just chose to do it within the browser um, based on the link that you sent me. Got it, got it. And basically you do not have yet an enlistment with this uh, source code on your machine. Uh, you haven't synced to get the changes. Everything is done through this live share connection. Yeah, all I did was open the link that you sent me and I'm able to see basically your entire repository and changes that you have locally done. Okay, so any any ideas of how to approach this now? Um, I think um, based on your changes, I don't think it's in your changes. So maybe we can go back to that train underscore cmd dot cpp file. Um, and we can take a look at a variable that I had taken a look at earlier, which is uh, a variable that tracks the vehicle status. Um, and that's called VEH status. Um, sorry, searching the wrong. And so I think this variable is a good place to start. Um, maybe first we can take a look at the definition. So I'll right click and go to definition. Okay, um, so it's basically a status variable for uh, vehicles. 
And then um, what I can do is maybe find all references and see whenever this vehicle status is called upon. So let's uh, right click and find all references. Oh, interesting. I see a pop-up on my screen saying that final references are being confirmed and computed. Yeah, so basically I called the find all references command and your computer is going to do all the computational work behind that and then show me all the references on my screen after that's done. So that's being computed. Okay, so 182 results showed up. So that's quite a lot of references, but it looks like it wouldn't have as many states to track um, associated with it. So maybe what we can do is track the state of this member variable at debug time. Um, and maybe that's something you can do during uh, run debug by setting a breakpoint. Yeah, that sounds like a, like a very good idea. Um, uh, why don't we switch to my screen for the audience um, and I, I can set the breakpoint that you just suggested. Yeah, sure. I'll switch to following you and follow along. All right. So I'll, uh, I'll go to train controller uh, again and uh, uh, set a, a breakpoint at the top here. Um, just to get us started. Um, and we'll wait for the breakpoint to hit. And now we have a full snapshot of the state uh, of the debugger. And um, one of the things that I have to do now, uh, usually, would be to expand this tree and uh, chase down the variable that we want to set a breakpoint. Um, but with the new version of Visual Studio Code, um, I can make this a lot faster uh, by doing Control F and actually search in this tree. And this is a feature that um, works across all of the trees in uh, Visual Studio Code um, and that I happen to be using now as part of the variables. And then I scroll, it's much easier to find this, this variable called the VH status. Uh, so if I right click here, um, I can go and say break on value change, which is what CNM suggested earlier. Um, and um, this is uh, a new feature in Visual Studio Code called data breakpoints that is currently supported with uh, the GDB debugger only. Uh, so it happens that I'm in the right debugger right now. I'm debugging on Windows, but using the WSL extension to connect to my WSL environment. And in there, I am using the GDB debugger. Um, in the future, we'll add data breakpoints to other debugger engines as well. Uh, for now, it's only supported with uh, GDB. Um, for completeness, uh, Visual Studio Code supports other types of breakpoints as well. Um, what I said here earlier to stop execution and get access to the state of the program is a line breakpoint. Um, I can also set function breakpoints uh, where I specify the function name and the moment the execution of the program uh, reaches that function, um, the execution stops. Um, and I can also apply customizations to a breakpoint. Uh, for example, um, I can, instead of breaking execution of the program, just lock a message in the output uh, at the location where I've specified, or I can create conditions uh, for a breakpoint whether to stop execution on that line, whether by specifying an expression or a hit count of how many times the, the breakpoint got hit. Um, we won't play with the settings as well uh, today, but um, I invite you to try them all uh, and use them in your debugging sessions. For now, I'll just remove this line breakpoint and uh, use this data breakpoint to detect, hopefully, uh, when the state uh, changes to entering or exiting the tunnel, which is uh, the location in code that we're looking for. So it looks like the breakpoint already hit. Yeah, um, and this seems like a promising place to fix the bugs. And I think I may know what the fix is. Cool. So um, I think here we set the sign in the state to zero um, since we're leaving the tunnel. And then above it, so we're, we're the state. entering the tunnel. So. I'll set the v sign state equal to vs hidden. We're hiding the sign. This is super cool. I think this will do the trick, you know. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm uh, actually think ready to check in, and I was uh, 
just wondering, um, since we both contributed on this code, how I'm gonna uh, mention that in the in the check-in, but it looks like uh, LiveShare already took care of it and added this note here for my check-in that this was co-authored by you as well. So thank you very much for, uh, for uh, your insights and for fixing the bug. Uh, and thank you LiveShare for making our life a lot easier to get through this fix. And uh, with that, um, this is a wrap for it for this demo and we'll go back to the slides. All right, so that was our second demo on learning more about setting up VS Code on Windows and Linux. Um, we have a few slides coming up going into more of the C++ debugging features. So as you saw earlier in that demo, we have new data breakpoints that allow you to stop an execution um, whenever a variable changes in value. Um, there's also now M1 debugging support so that all the VS Code um, C++ capabilities are available on the latest Macs. And we have simplified the run debug play button so you can start running and debugging your C++ files with a single click. Um, you also saw in the demo that I was able to use Git features to see what was changed in the code. Um, there's a lot of Git, Git features incorporated into VS Code so you can source code manage within VS Code. Um, some new features include having a local history sidebar so you can see sort of any things that were changed with your files locally. Um, and there's also a three-way merge editor for whenever you're merging your code. There's also uh, the ability to hide explorer files using git ignore. So whatever is set in git ignore can be hidden and git branch protection. These are all supported within VS Code. VS Code also supports multi-root workspaces across various different source code managers. So you can have an ADO uh, repository next to a GitHub repository and have those all open within VS Code at the same time. Um, VS Code also supports those with remote development needs. So as you may have saw in the demo, we had WSL2, which allows you to spin up a Linux environment on Windows without traditional VM management issues. And that's really awesome. And there's a lot of support for that within VS Code. Um, also, as you saw earlier, there is VS Code Live Share, which allows you to view and edit code in real time with others just by sharing a link. And it really helps manage all of that collaboration. And then also VS Code collaborates with GitHub Code Spaces to allow you to have the full VS Code IDE power from the cloud and browser within GitHub Code Spaces. So you can um, debug your code online and also collaborate with others using config files. Um, so we have a short demo coming up sort of explaining GitHub code spaces in the power of that. I actually realized I really prefer using the browser to edit my code rather than software-based IDEs. Unfortunately, most browser-based editors do not have full computational power for debugging capabilities. Luckily, there's code spaces easily integrated into GitHub that allows me to have full debugging capabilities configured. All I need to do is navigate to the repository that I want and go to this code icon. Then I navigate to the code spaces tab and just select create code spaces on the branch of my choosing. In this particular case, it's new project config. This will spin up a new GitHub code spaces instance that I can then configure. Code spaces provisions a virtual machine and stages a container on it to provide full computational power for your project. So, this will spin this up shortly. Now you can see that there is an online VS Code instance of my repository. All I need to do to fully configure this is open the command palette using Control Shift P and type in container. I can add development container configuration files. I just select which language I'm developing in, in this case it's C++, and then which version of the machine I want to use. In this case I'll use Ubuntu and then any additional features I would like to install. In this case, I don't need any. This will create .dev container files and a Docker file that I can then configure so that my project can build on this virtual machine. I will skip ahead and walk through the contents of these files. I have now edited my .dev container files so that my project can build on this CodeSpaces instance. As you can see in the output window, the build has finished generating and has completed successfully. So that's really awesome. This is able to have its full build capabilities and debugging capabilities within this CodeSpaces instance in my browser. In the dev container file, I just kept everything generic, but you can also specify a different Docker file if you do not want to use the generic Docker file. 
You can specify also any run arguments that you need. In this case, this was just the, the default and also any instances of extensions that you would like to be installed when the container is created. In this case, all I wanted was CPP tools and CMake tools, which is what they provided, but you can have any other extensions installed. You can also uncomment these last two sections to make a list of ports, for example, or run have any specify any run commands after the container is created. In the Docker file, all I did was uncomment the last section to install any additional packages that this specific repository depended on. In this case, these were the libraries that it depended on. Then all I needed to do is reopen the command palette and rebuild the container so that the, these were all able to run inside of it. In the future, if I need to make any changes, I can just make any changes to these two files and then rebuild the container again and the new container will reflect the new configuration settings that I set. Now that the build has finished generating, I'm able to go to any sort of CPP file and have the full debugging capabilities. In this case, I can navigate to this file and see, for example, if I hover over this vehicle information, I can get any sort of information about that. I can also right click and find all references and this browser will do all the computational power of finding all references, which is really awesome. It also has full IntelliSense capabilities as well as you can see. And now the best part is, is that I can commit these files to the branch and then anyone else working on this project, such as a coworker, can then go to that branch and build a working environment for themselves from this. So they can just utilize the branch that I made these changes on and spin up their own code spaces that will work from scratch instead of me having to send manual steps or manual information about packages that need to do be downloaded. Whenever I'm done, with my project, all I need to do is navigate to the bottom left corner code spaces icon and select stop current code space. This will pause this current code space in the current state and then I can always reopen it and resume my work on this code space. Stopping the code space only pauses it and I can always reopen it in the state that it was left in. If I ever want to completely delete a code space, all I need to do is go to my repository that I opened the code space in, navigate to the code button, and then select manage all code spaces. From this view, I can then delete any code space that I want using this button. I can always spin up a new code space after it has been deleted, but this will be a completely new code space and will not have any of the saved properties that haven't been committed from the previous one. All right, so that was our last demo on the power of GitHub code spaces. If you're interested in learning more about GitHub code spaces, you can check out the link below, or also there are two talks going on, one this afternoon by Michael Price and one on Friday in the morning by Michael Price. As you can see, there is multiple ways to use remote development features. One topic we didn't get a chance to talk about was embedded development in VS Code. The Embedded Tools extension provides the ability to debug on devices with peripheral and RTOS views. The extension also provides you with a serial monitor for monitoring the state of embedded devices and sending messages. We are working with other silicon partners such as IAR, and their extension brings support for their project and build systems and CSPY debugger leveraging the core views provided by the embedded tools extension. If you want to learn more about this, there's actually a talk going on right now um, by Mark Gunner about overcoming embedded tool link challenges. So what do you think? Install VS Code using the link below and try out all of our features. Um, thank you so much for listening to our session. We have many other sessions going on at CPPCon, and we would love if you would check them out to learn more. Also, if you could please join our Discord, we would love to get to know you and answer any sort of questions that you may have. We also would love, like we said before, if you could take our survey as these really help us serve you, the C++ community.